Thank you very, very much. I'm so excited to be here, I gotta tell you. I can hardly contain myself. I love speaking at events because it feels like coming home. It feels like your family is here. It feels like you're back on your planet. Because when I hang out with civilians, mere mortals, and they ask me what I do, I, it's very hard to explain. And I, lo I love my, my work so much and I want to talk about it all the time. But people ask, so what do you do for a living? I, just, eh, I start explaining. They go like, oh yeah, IT. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I broke my printer the other day, you know, so can, I, can you help me? I'm like, ah. I don't, I don't really optimize printers. It's more like, you know, websites. SEO, yeah, 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 yeah. So like traffic and Google, yeah, yeah. My brother, my brother has like a, a little web shop. Could you help him? Whew. Wow. Then you start explaining what it really is, and you see people's eyes like drift off. Oh, oh God. So, but that's not the case here. So thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to hang out with my extended family. It's going to be a lovely couple of days. All right. I would like to start by telling you a little story. There once was a company, and they wanted to make a lot of money. Uh, they were operating in a dying industry, so they've got probably a couple of years left before uh, their product is obsolete. And uh, so what, what, what's a quick way of, of, of making money? Well, we can optimize the website. They, they have, they have, it's just one sales channel, uh, the website, right? So what could they do? Well, they sat down, they talked about it, and uh, there's this thing called responsive web design, right? That's the, that's the big thing. You know, they read, they read the, uh, the article where it says, like, you know, five signs that your website is outdated, eh, it's not responsive. You know, they had the, the marketing consultant who was telling them, you know, behavior has shifted and people buy from mobile phones now, not desktop. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So it sounded like a great idea. So they did it. They were like, yeah, you know, if we get a responsive website, we'll make more money. So they invested in a responsive uh, redesign. Put a lot of money into it. They waited a whole year. So they're even closer to dying. And they finally got it. They implemented it. And they were so excited. It was going to explode. Make money. So this was actually what happened. It was, the, it was, it was insane. It just went... <laughs> revenue. <laughs> and you know, conversions. Everything went down. It was over 40% drop. It's like, it's like a CRO horror story. It's like the worst possible thing that could happen. And these guys were shell-shocked. They're like... I had no idea what the hell happened. They talked to all the consultants, they, they, they got the responsive web design, and they're losing money. That's too bad. So, and it gets even worse. Like, these guys are just burning money because th there's the cost of the responsive web design in itself, right? And there's a serious loss of revenue, then there's cost of damage control because the, the, the panic reaction is just, you know, display ads and, you know, just get more traffic, get more traffic, and then they're paying, they're paying, right? And uh, damage control is also hiring someone to help figure out what the hell's wrong with it, right? So, and then there's a double work of kind of <laughs> backtracking, finding out what the hell happened and how are we going to fix this, right? So my point now is, of course, not that they should have tested it and then seen that would, a lame point, of course. That wouldn't, we're not even close to that. What I'm talking about is like the basic hypothesis. It doesn't seem like there was one. It just seemed like it was a good idea. It was something everybody else does. So we also have to do it. So at one point they contacted me and I got involved. One of the first things I try to do is try to find out, so what went so horribly wrong? So we're looking at before and after. And there were some obvious things. Like the, it, um, the whole checkout funnel was not responsive. Right? So you go from a responsive experience to the most important part, and then you're like, you know, you're trying to get through the thing, and it's, it's very complicated. There's a lot of steps. So that was a problem also. They weren't addressing, uh, or, and, and the drop-off rate in the funnel was crazy. It was over 90%. That's serious. And they had other serious problems they weren't addressing. They weren't answering the questions that the clients have. They weren't presenting them with the right arguments. So there's a lot of stuff here that they could have, they could have done, but none of them thought of it, right? So this is kind of like, it's kind of like this, you know? This is what they're doing. They're trying, there's obviously a big problem here, right? But what they're doing is they're focusing on the top of the funnel here, right? So it's like, please use the bins provided because litter causes delays. So, you know, and, and, and right now, actually, it's, it's successful because there's two pieces of garbage here and there's one here, right? So it's working. It's working so far. Double. We, we doubled it, right? Okay, so what else now? Uh, well, this still is not quite what we, what we hoped for. So, yeah, we, we, should, we could change the sign. You know, we could change the color of the sign. We, 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 we could even change this so that if, you're like, if you put a Coke can in, it goes, you know, put something in there, it goes, 
like that. You know, we keep on going, yeah, Cialdini, I read Cialdini's book, right? There's all these different principles. We can test them all, right? And the copy here, and we can get more people. It's like, this is, <laughs> this is where it's going on. This is the horrible thing, right? So that's kind of, I, I used to do this all the time, you know, just mindless kind of <laughs> testing up here. And it was, it was insane because, like, I thought I was being scientific, you know, because I was testing so that in itself, I thought, made me a scientist. And I also thought that, you know, I was like, ah, oh, you shouldn't do guesswork, right? You should test, because then you stop guessing. But I was still just guessing. I was just testing my guesses. So, you know, it made no sense. So this is like me. This is actually the, this is the, this is the young Michael Agard from about five years ago, right? So it's like, ah, I'm a split test young guy. Test like crazy. Testing is the coolest thing in the world. Everyone can do it. It's really easy. You should just do it, right? So this is me now. It's like, dumbass. Wow, that was just so wrong, man. Like, if the old Michael Agard could meet the young one, oh, they would have it out. Oh, by the way, this is what happens when you work with CRO for a long time with a lot of clients. <laughs> Stressful, man. He aged like 10 years in, in a couple. All right. Okay. So, back to the hypothesis part, right? A hypothesis is not a guess, and it's not a good idea, and it's not like, you know, wouldn't it be fun to do this? Wouldn't it be uh, interesting to see what would happen if we did this? I heard of that. No, no, no. What a hypothesis is, it's an informed solution to a real problem. And it's not an arbitrary guess. And another very, very important point is that it's the starting point for further research, right? So it's not a definitive answer. It's a starting point, right? And a really good... Hypothesis consists of three things, in my opinion. And there are different ways of, of doing this, right? I think there has to be three things here. We have to know what the change we're going to make, right? Then we have to have an idea of how this will affect our prospects. And then we want to have, in the hypothesis also, the impact that we uh, expect to see as a result, right? And we have to have the three in there. And I see a lot of people actually forgetting about the prospects, about, forgetting about the people. And that's, that, to me, that's a major mistake because you need that. It's not when we're optimizing, and that's why I talk about optimizing decisions, it's real people. It's their decisions who make our conversion rates go up, right? It's not just ones and zeros. It's not just numbers and analytics and in, in, in spreadsheets. It's real people that we have to impact. So if we take them out of the, the, the uh, equation, it's just not going to work, right? So a very, very simple way of getting some practice with hypotheses is something like this. A very, very easy little template here, right? We got everything in there. By changing x into x, I can get more prospects to x and thus increase x, okay? So we got the whole thing in there. It's cause and effect. We have the change, we have the impact we expect it to have in the minds of our prospects, and the change we see, right? So I think it's very, very central to what we're doing that we think in hypotheses, and I, I find it's very, I, I do it all the time. I've, I've tried to hardwire my brain to think in hypotheses constantly, right? And, and a big part of that is actually just saying, why? I spend so much time with clients just saying, why? Why would you do that? And in a lot of cases, there simply is no good reason. So if, if you start thinking like that in cause and effect, it will help you a lot. And also, I think it's important that we get a little bit away from only talking about test hypotheses, because we're really talking about optimization hypotheses. If we're focusing on test hypotheses right away, I think we're a couple of ste steps ahead of ourselves, right? Because it's not really the test that's, that's the main point, it's the optimization that's the, that's the important point. A test can come down, uh, longer down the road, but the op optimization part of it, we're working with that the whole way through. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you some uh, examples of it. But first, I would like to show you a very, very stupid A-B test that I personally conducted, okay? So this is the landing page for a free ebook I have. Uh, and it has a big, uh, it has Bob, a big orange button on there, right? And uh, I know from other experiments that the, the button copy is very important, right? So uh, this is the button copy I started with. This is a control, get my free ebook, which is, in, in, in my experience, a really, really good copy because it's talking about what you get, not what you have to part with. It has the, the benefit in there and everything, okay? So, but for a while, I thought it would, there was just this idea in my head that it would be really, really inter interesting to you know, play a little bit with psychology and stuff. And, you know, what if we go, don't click this button? You know, what would happen then? And I could never, ever do this on a client's website, right? <laughs> but I finally had the chance on my own here, right? So, I set it up, I ran the test. Control versus treatment, don't click this button, get my free ebook. Ran it for two months, I had almost 500 conversions, almost 500 downloads, 
and there was no difference. There was no difference. So this is the kind of testing I used to do. It's, it's pretty brain dead. I mean, and, and I, the only thing I did right here was that I ran it for a long time, and I got a lot of conversions, so that I was sure that it was, it was really, really stupid, right? And, and probably what I would have done earlier is I would have stopped it here, confirmation bias, when it showed me what I wanted to see, and be like, mm. And then I would, I would post a blog, blog post a case study, and I'd say, you know, ah, don't click this button. It's, it's, you know, you need to put it in, and everybody else starts doing it. All of a sudden, we have all these don't click this button. But really, you know, it didn't, it didn't matter. It's, it's fake. It's not there. And that's the stuff, I mean, it was like Pep got the question, what was the thing that kind of shook him up most? And, and stuff like this, really. It's, it's, I, was, I was so arrogant when I finally got to the point where I, I, I like admitted, man, I know very, very little. And that's kind of when things started moving. And I just, I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm saying, I'm just going to keep on learning forever. And, you know, it would be very, very arrogant to think that I, at some point, can't start, <laughs> keep on learning. One of the big reasons why is that from having attended a lot of different conferences like this, and spoken a lot of different conferences, I have had the privilege of meeting people like Pip Laya and Craig Sullivan, Andre Morris, Oli Gardner, conversion scientists, all these awesome guys. We can share. We can share our experiences. We can share all these things we don't understand. Why do we keep testing and testing and seeing these lifts and they're not there? Why? You know, we've developed together. And I've, I've been working with Craig lately and, and he's kind of been a mentor to me and it's, uh, I've, I've really learned a lot from working with him. So that's also just the message here. You can really get a lot out of these conferences. It's really, we're all here to share our knowledge. We're all still learning. Okay. So let me show you of an example of something I would do today instead of running this test, which is it's not just stupid because there wasn't a lift. It was stupid because there was no reason to do it. I had no hypothesis. I can after rationalize and try to come up with something that could have been a hypothesis, but it wasn't there. I had no idea. It was just because I thought it would be a sexy test. And that is never a good reason to test, right? So here's another example. Uh, this is a client I've been working with in Denmark. Uh, they, they, they have like a, a, a beauty clinic where they do laser treatment and stuff, right? So how do we optimize it? This is a home page. What are we going to do with the website? Well, back in the day, I probably would have uh, started with the button copy, I think. Uh, that would be the main thing. Like, uh, nowadays, I would do something different. Start my research and I would start asking questions. I would say, well, there's something serious missing here. Um, this is a highly competitive product. You get them, you know, you get these wellness deals all the time. There are all kinds of campaigns. There are tons of these guys in Copenhagen. Uh, and what is the one thing people want to know is how much is it, right? And there isn't, there isn't an, an overall pricing page on there. The competitors have it. And it's, in my experience, it's very likely that people are actually looking for information, right? So maybe we, it's not the right thing to have like tons of, of beautiful women all over the place. We're talking about, oh, your skin after this treatment will be blah, blah, blah. I have, my hypothesis was that people need facts, right? So how do we qualify that? Well, in this case, I used a little uh, feedback poll. You can see it down here. So this is in Danish. So there's only one guy in the room who, who can understand it. <laughs> A little you and me thing going on here. But actually what I was, I was trying to find out here was, what the questions I was asking was, why did you visit, visit the website today? Was it to check prices? Was it to learn more about our treatments? Or was it to book, right? And the client was sure that everybody was there to book. You know, that's what we have to focus on. So we ran the, ran the feedback poll, and it turns out that 40% are there to check prices, right? That's a pretty clear sign. And then to learn more, and then actually only 23% were actually there to book. So what do we need to focus on? It's getting clearer. The pricing is important. So further uh, uh, confirmation here, when we go to a landing page for one of the products, they have prices on there. And we look at a, at a click map, we'll see that 26% that 20, of the clicks are right down here. That's another indication that, uh, that, that pricing is important, right? So I'm putting the, the pieces together, and my hypothesis is, you know, that, that there's, a, there's a, a big hole in the middle of the decision-making process here. There's something very, very fundamental that I need to know, and I'm not being told it. So if you can put that on the page, you know, we, we, can, we can bridge a serious gap, and we can motivate people to actually say yes, and then we can get more leads, right? Okay, so I, we, we created the, the pricing page here, uh, and then we put it in also as, or we're going we're gonna to use it uh, in, the, in the global nav, and then... We're going to test it, right? We're going to run a test to see if it works. Ah, let's just stop for one second. It's actually a hypothesis that we can test, that we can run proper A-B tests. So you want to, don't
double check that, okay? So it's a low traffic, uh, or, yeah, low traffic website. This is not the true conversion rate. It's around there. I just put in two, okay? So this is a likely scenario. I know that they only get about 500 visitors a day, okay? So if the current conversion rate is 2%, and, uh, well, you know, it's a little bit high, but let's put in a 10% lift. We think we can get a 10% lift by giving this very, very important information. And we have two variations. We have 500 visitors a day, include 100% of traffic. It would take us 314 days to get a result. That's insane. It's ridiculous. Why would we do that? I mean, you, and I, I used to do this all the time. You know, I started test, and, and it would just be blah, going into oblivion, and I had no idea. So things like these, this is also part of a hypothesis. We need to understand, can we actually run a proper test? And there's, there's a, a couple different considerations here, because one thing is, is, like, the geek in me wants to test everything, but like Andre says, it's too expensive. We have clients. You know, we're doing work here. It's not just for my own pleasure, right? So what would I need... I, I run most of my tests for four weeks, so, so what would I, how, how would I be able to get it down to around there? Well, I need a lift of 33%, then I'll be down at 35 uh, days. I'm not willing to risk that because I'm not sure it's going to do that, so I, I, I could end up really hurting myself here. So instead, we implemented it, we tracked it, and we saw it just from the very first day, it was on the top three most visited pages on the website, and it keeps going. Another thing that happened was we started getting leads. We started actually getting leads from the pricing page, which was amazing. They are going, oh, wow, reasonable, oh, 50%, oh, sure. Okay, so we got another lead gen page on top of that. Okay, so this is another way of doing optimization. And the point here, of course, is that A-B testing, like Andre was talking about, and zero are not the same thing. People often introduce me as an A-B tester. Oh, Michael's a great A-B tester. Like, I get angry, you know? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the split test junkie anymore. That's one of the tools that I can use if it is helpful. In this situation, it would not have been helpful. We would not have gotten the insight we needed. So, so choose not to do it. So really thinking a hypothesis like this helps us avoid stupid shit. So that's the main reason why we want to always, you know, we want to hardwire our brains to think in hypotheses. So what happens if the uh, hypothesis backfires and it doesn't work? Well, let me show you a couple of examples. This is a... Uh, Betting site, a betting forum. I think I better walk down a little bit here so uh, you don't get seasick. I have a little bit more of a width I can span here. Okay, so this was a betting expert, uh, uh, an online betting forum. And on the home page here, this is like the main landing page and we want people to sign up. We want as many people to sign up as possible. Now, one of the things that, that I've, I've been fascinated with by forums for a long time, and one of the things that I was, I was seeing a lot of places is the privacy policy, okay? And it would be a likely hypothesis that maybe people aren't quite comfortable giving their information here, right? So maybe a privacy policy would work. So I stole a privacy policy from a very, very popular American online marketing blog, because these guys must know what they're doing, right? And uh, this was my hypothesis. By, by adding a privacy policy, I can reduce friction, get more prospects to, sign, uh, to give me their info, and then I can increase uh, signups, right? Okay. So put the privacy policy on there, ready to run the test, I'm ready to prove the, to the client that I am the world's most awesome optimizer. I can do incredible shit with just one sentence. Uh, it didn't work at all, so it, it mega backfired, right? And if I hadn't tested this, well, that would have been a serious problem. And this was a situation where we actually could test because we had enough traffic. So, and stuff like this is really, really humbling, in my opinion. And, and you need, I, well, I'm saying you, I need this once in a while because I can get up, you know, the ego kind of gets very big and then you do a test like that and it kind of deflates and that's really, really cool. And then you can, you know, start learning some more. All right, so, so what, do we, what do we take away here? Does this mean that privacy policies do not work? Is that it? We disproved the... Uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, the hypothesis, well, not necessarily. Maybe it was just, you know, the wrong way to present it. We were just, maybe we, the, the hypothesis is fine. We just need to tweak it a little bit, okay? So, to know a little bit about how the brain works, there's this guy called uh, Kahneman. He has a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, awesome thing. He's talking about how you, you have a, a very, very quick intuitive part of the brain, like system one, okay? And then you have system two, which is the more analytical. It's not, it's not like your brain is divided into two different parts. It's just two different ways of thinking. And, and system one is very intuitive, and it's built on, on uh, experience and all kinds of memories and stuff, and it fires very, very quickly. And actually, system two is very, very lazy, very, very, you know, it, it takes a lot to wake it up, right? So system one, for example, walking, 
that's system one. You know, if I had to use system two to that, we'd be like, we'd never get anywhere. And multitasking would be out of the question, okay? So system two is like the lazy controller that we really have to wake up. It's like system one is zipping away, and system two is like asleep back there. And then once in a while, system one goes, hey, system two, I need your help. And it, it wakes it up. And it's, it's very hard for us to, to, to use system two for a long time. Uh, we get depleted. It actually it burns glucosis, right? So in a situation like this, where you see the spam word, what do you take away from it? If you use System 2 just for a second, you read it and say, they're actually saying that they're not going to do it. But when you see it very, very quickly, all you see is the spam thing. So what if we take that away, right? Then we can reduce friction, and we can get more prospects to sign up. And so I ran this test, and this one worked, right? Okay, so we're working with hypothesis. This one worked, okay. Very, very cool. So if you have a very solid hypothesis, you should also be able to reverse it. So the other way around here, by removing the guarantee and adding the word spam, I can increase friction, get less prospects to give me their information, and thus decrease signups, right? So I tested this on my own landing page. And yeah, I hurt conversions very badly by doing it. Okay, but I've, I've, now I've, I'm seeing something working. I've seen it on different websites. So this is a pretty solid hypothesis. So, I, so this is, for me, a very, very interesting way of working, right? And we're always moving forward, we're always learning. Even when we got a negative result before, we got a learning and we could keep on working with that. So what I'm getting ahead here, of course, is best practice, what I used to do. It, it, it would work sometimes. I, I was against best practice, but I was really in, just inventing my own best practices. And I couldn't figure out why it was like, on this case, it was just such a big success. And over here, it just didn't work, right? I, I didn't have... I didn't have any form of methodology. And that's really what people need out there. And most clients I meet, that's what they need. they need. They need discipline, they need structure, and they need a specific set of tools and a specific way of working, okay? So I used to only do this. And now, basically, what I spend most of my time doing is conducting research, hypothesizing, and then analyzing results afterwards, okay? So today we're going to, of course, focus on uh, re research and hypotheses. So let's get into some examples here. Uh, so when we do uh, website reviews, Craig and I, this is part of the methodology we use. So one of the things, I would probably do a, a quick walkthrough of the site, just get a quick idea of what's going on, and then I would dip my toes in analytics and just look at, at you know, some of the stats, get an idea of who's visiting the website, how they're doing it, where they're coming from. So I would look at the uh, device categories, for example, get an idea of that. Then I'd move on to looking at browsers, and here we can see... Safari is number one. Wow, very interesting. But no, that wasn't quite actually the reality because most of our, our, our visitors are from desktop, but Safari can be on all kinds of different uh, devices. So, you know, let's uh, throw in a, a, a segment, right? Ah, it turns out that Firefox is actually the one. We're looking at only desktop traffic now. So this is not going to be like an, an, an analytics <laughs> session. I just want to show you just a couple of examples here and how you have to dig a little bit deeper always. If you only look at the first numbers, well, you might be actually uh, misled. Okay? So some of the other reports I would look at here just quickly as, of course, top landing pages. Look at some site search. What are people looking for? It might be because they can't find it. Uh, new versus returning. Uh, navigation overview is one I, I use a lot because in a lot of cases you're trying to find out, so why are people exiting here? Or, or sorry, uh, we, we want people to do something specific, but what is it that they're doing? So with navigation uh, uh, summary, for example, uh, you, can, you can go in there and just see where are people going after been to this page. And in a lot of cases, that actually tells you what it is that they're looking for. So that's another little sneaky one. And of course, use, learn to use uh, advanced segments. Very, very important. It changed my way of working. But I'll just walk you through the process now. So what I'll do is I'll, I would have uh, analytics in one browser. And then I'll have the website in the other browser, and then I'll start digging for data. I'll start trying to understand what we could call the conversion scenario. So this was one we did for a company called Zspoke uh, in Ireland, and they do uh, bespoke furniture. You, you order it, you, you choose your own design, and then they, they, they handcraft it in the UK, and they send it to you, right? So this is the home page. So just doing a little heuristic review here. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to rock, walk through the whole funnel and understand it, and I'm trying to, to, to you know, be aware a little bit of, of how am I reacting to all the things going on. So first of all, of course, it's a huge page. There's so many products. And you know, to me, that doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't think that, it seem like they've really thought about it. They have, 
they have a slider that just has 10 slides or something, and, and some of them say click here and you can't click it. It's, and some of the pictures are really, 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 really bad. It's just like 3G generated stuff. Uh, uh, free shipping is not a button. Free samples is a button. What are the free samples? I don't know. It's very confusing. Free shipping is an awesome, awesome, awesome uh, value proposition, but it's kind of like it's drowning there. Another thing is, is it's hard to identify what kind of furniture this is and what does this mean and why do they have all this stuff here, right? So, uh, for example, the, the search bar is very, very small. If you, if, you, if you click on the navigation, it'll still be this one that, you know, that, is, that is highlighted so you can't really understand where you're going. So there's tons of things and I'm writing all these things down uh, and saving them for later. Another thing I'm doing is I'm writing the URLs down as I go. Okay, so it goes to the next page, it goes to the category page, another slider. And they're using like four slides to explain something that you could explain in just, just a few bullet points, right? So that's taking up a lot of space, it's confusing. Uh, we have misleading copy here because you don't add to cart, you read more. So I would definitely make sure to change that. Uh, some of the same comments as on the home page. Writing all this stuff down, we go to the next page, the product page. And now it starts to get interesting. My brain did a number on me when I got into this one. I simply, it took me so long to decipher it. It was, it's, it's, what, what, what are all these things out here? They're actually images. All of them are images. And well, this one is one image. Uh, that's an image, that's an image. This is one big image. And it was, it was deeply, deeply confusing. Uh, up here, we have a price, and then we just have a whole lot of, of, of interaction stuff here. So it, it takes you a long time to decipher everything. And, down here, this is a very, very important element. This is actually a little uh, interactive editor. You can, you, can, you can put in your different colors and you can see the design you're doing. But it's all the way at the bottom of the page. And they have a, the video that's like the instruction video is also at the bottom. So it's very, very confusing. It's a long page, weird, uh, weird hierarchy here. So I'm, this one is, is one I'm going to put a note on. I think this one is very, very interesting to return to. <clears throat> so. We found a very, very interesting bug also. You're supposed to choose the different colors here on, on the drop downs, right? But if you go down first and use uh, the interactive designer that you're supposed to use, and you go up and you try to choose something, well, then it's gone, right? So if you do what they actually wanted you to do, then your options disappear. So that's a serious bug. And we're just going to fix that. I mean, are we going to test that? It's like, you know, testing whether having a, having a door gets more people into the shop, you know? Oh, we've got to hypothesize that if we had a door, we'd get more in. Let's see what happens. Ah, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. That's, that's a no-brainer. We've got to fix that right away, as soon as possible. Uh, we get to the cart. Uh, quick rundown. It's, it's, it's not horrible, but I would question a little bit about the buttons down here and... Um, I think there's a lot of white space going on here. I don't really think that this is, this is, this is a, a terrible page. So this one is, is kind of, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on that one. Ooh, we get to the checkout. This gets interesting. Now we're really getting somewhere. Okay, so this is actually three steps in one. And probably the idea is, you know, the, the more steps you have, the more people disappear from the website. Not necessarily. It's all about perception. If you see something like this, it can be very, very stressful for the brain. There's a lot going on here. Yeah, there's a lot to get an overview over. So I probably want to simplify this. Another thing is, when you start going, filling out your information, and I'm, I'm from Denmark, so I want to send there, it gives me all these options, which is great. It actually knows the cities in Denmark. I've never, ever seen this before. So I'm happy. I'm enthusiastic. And then when I fill it out, pretty much what it says here is they can't send it to Denmark. I was like, well, that's pretty goddamn disappointing. And it says, contact us. So I, I, I click contact us. And <laughs> so what? This is where I end. And so this says something about getting color sent. I can't even read it here. It says, if ordering color swatch samples, please provide your address to be posted to, exclamation point. I have no idea what that means. They have a great little capture down here. And then I can continue. So this is really a dead end. That, that's, that's just weird. Then we get to the PayPal payment. I can't do anything here, so you know, why bother with that? Then we get to the confirmation page, the thank you page. It doesn't really confirm much. So I've, I've, I don't feel like I'm, I've really gotten a confirmation. It doesn't tell me anything. What happens? When, is, when am I going to get my stuff? How long is it going to be? And so on. And then they have this... Security seal here. It says, secure your purchase now. Secure my purchase? So I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to get it? I have to do something else with a third-party tool to make sure that I get my purchase? That does not make me feel very confident, okay? 
So now we've done the heuristic stuff, we've done a little bit of analytics, we kind of know the situation, so now it's time to build a f you know, go, through, go through the funnels and find out where the real problems are. So I was pretty sure that the checkout was the worst thing. That was definitely what I would go for. But what we found out was that the biggest problem right now is the product page. It's very surprising. Actually, the checkout worked fine right now. Amazing. So it looks like we have some very, very dedicated users actually getting to it and then getting through it. So we should focus on the biggest problem right away. So this, go back to the product page. So basically, this is a very, very, very confusing layout. The information hierarchy is way off. So that's like my basic hypothesis. I think we can rearrange all this content here in a much, much more um, uh, intuitive way for the, for the users. And also another consideration is that this, they don't have a huge budget, these guys. So what we're suggesting to them, we, we, we can't go like all, all crazy and, and you know, build a, a highly technical new responsive website for them. They can't really do that. Okay? So we, we have to stay within what they can do. So this is what you see above the fold. This is very, very uh, confusing, right? And you don't even really know what you're doing here. And it's just a lot of different tabs you can work with. What does that mean? So, the overall hypothesis is that by re rearranging the product page content, we can create a more logical user experience, we can re reduce cognitive friction, and then we can get people to configure the product and increase purchases. Okay? So, I go straight to uh, a wireframe from there. You know, it's like we don't want to do it too quickly, but we also don't want to lose momentum. So, go straight to visualizing it. Does this seem like something that might work? Yes, it does. It might be a, a good way to, to, to do it. Then I go straight to a mockup. And this is uh, basically what it came up with. So we got the price. Uh, we're saying that they, you know, there's free shipping. We got some reviews. There's 60 something. Uh, we got the description here. We're telling them all the stuff about you know this, it's handmade in the UK. Uh, the value proposition, all the information about sizes and everything. We over here we put, I, 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 um, set it up in a, in a little picture slider here, so it's very easy to to understand kind of. Uh, what the pictures are and how you can change between them. We got the editor here because it makes no sense that you have it at the bottom of the page because you need, you need it right here next to uh, the options. So, and another, so uh, probably the ultimate thing it would be is that when you've created your design here, then it's, it fills out the tabs and you're ready to go on, right? So this is what you would see above the fold with this one, okay? So now we have a treatment. And I'm not necessarily saying that we have to implement this one. This is pretty fast. But now we have something we can keep going with. We can do some further research. We can maybe do a user test. We can you know, do session recordings. We can do all kinds of stuff to get it on there. Next thing is we're probably going to open the other steps also. We, we can go back to the home page. So what should we put on the home page? Well, we can guess or, well, we can go to e-commerce and we can see what are the top uh, selling categories, what are the top selling products. And now we have a great idea to put in there. Do a little wireframe, and now we can visualize it. We can help the client understand what it is we're trying to do. Okay? Another thing, when we're doing a funnel analysis, this is an example from another website review we did. Okay? So this was a, a, a SaaS product. And so they have the typical thing. You have the home page, you have the pricing page, you got the form, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you get the confirmation, you get the email, and then you get to the success, success page, and you can log in. You got your, you got your um, account set up. All right. So what we saw when we went through analytics was that there was there were a lot of people who never got from the email to the to the confirmation page and logged in. We're trying to figure out why. So it all had to do with the email, right? So we want people to do, go to the ver verification. That is this link right here. All the other links go to other pages that we don't want them to go to, and that's because they're using one general template for everything, right? So that's a major. Uh, major, major mistake. So we're losing all these people who are going, uh, going to the login, and pretty much what it says is you need an account to log in. And you're like, well, I just did it. I just did it. So that's a really, really horrible user experience. So we need to fix that. You know, this money is pouring out. Visitors are pouring out. So we can fart around with the home page forever. We can tweak headlines. We can tweak buttons. But we're never going to get anywhere until we fix this major hole. And again, it was a big problem on mobile here, even more. So basically, what we need to do to fix it is just simplify the email. Take out the link, have one big button you can click. Okay? So funnels like this I spend a lot of time on. They're very, very important. When you set it up like this, you can easily find out where the biggest potential for lift is. So this is actually a real example from a client. <laughs> so an 80% drop-off between step one and two. It's pretty goddamn clear what we got to 
start working now. The second biggest one is between step four and five. So that would be the next thing I would start working on here, okay? A little trick. If you don't have uh, uh, funnels set up, you can hack them manually. So you'll type in the URL. You've gone through the funnel. You've typed in all the URLs. You can find them uh, if you go to all pages report. You write them down. You write down the um, unique page views, and you do that for every step, and then you have your funnel. Very, very quick hack. So basically what we're doing here is plumbing, right? It's plumbing. So we got the uh, conversion scientist over here, and uh, I'll just be the uh, conversion plumber. It's not very sexy, but I mean, I've, I've, I've come to terms with it. I'm not Don Draper, I'm actually just a plumber, right? Okay. So when we're talking about funnels and just talking about the whole experience, there's one thing that's important. This is also from Kahneman. I love this uh, quote. He says, in the economy of action, effort is a cost. Laziness is built deep into our system. I think it's very, very important to remember, right? Make it at, as simple as possible for people to do what you want them to do to get through the website. A lot of websites, they look like this, right? And, and yeah, of course, so this is the checkout. This is the biggest obstacle. We want that, save that for the last. When people are really, really exhausted, their brains can't handle it anymore, then we have to get them to crawl through that, right? So this is basically what I feel like with most websites, getting through it. Ah, you're fighting, and when you get out of the other end, you're like, yes, I did it. I'm a champ. We want the opposite to happen. We want people to not quite even notice they're getting through there. So whenever you make me think little things can really slow me down, really, really slow me down, I want to show you an example here. Just, it's just kind of a cute little example I, I found the other day. I was going through a travel website, and uh, another review, and we were having some trouble here on this page. And so one of the funny little things I noticed here, so you put in your name, you put in your email, and then it says, please have a special agent call me. And for some reason, the first thing I thought I was just daddy, right? <laughs> Or you could call me Al, maybe, right? So that was really, really confusing. What the hell does he mean? Any questions? Can I really choose what you want to call me? So when you get the error message afterwards, they're asking for the phone number. You know? But little things like this accumulate, so you need to get rid of those. And other things like, for example, a page like this, where there's just, it's impossible to, 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 to multitask in this way and to understand everything on the page. This is a big, big killer in my experience. Okay, so one thing that's really, really important in order to actually be able to, to, to work with hypotheses and get anywhere and be able to validate them is that you need to run clean tests so you actually are getting insight, right? So here's an example of a test I ran on, um, it's, it's a lead gen site and they do shipping requests, okay? So you go through the form and then you, get, uh, you write down what you have to get shipped and you get some uh, free offers sent. So what I did was I hypothesized that by removing the progress bar, we would actually hurt conversions, okay? Because I've seen progress bars all over the place. People talk about them being good. But, uh, but let's see, actually, and test them for ourselves. So I took it away. I ran the split test. Look at the average. I ran it for nine full weeks. We have 1,500 conversions. And we have, well, a 4% drop in, in leads, but it's not really significant. What do we do? This is, this is, we spent nine weeks and wasted our time. Well, it's because we only looked at the average. It's very, very important to actually segment and know what's going on in your test, right? So on desktop, as I expected, we saw a drop of 9.8%, okay? Wow, that means it's very important we have the, the progress bar. It was the opposite on mobile. On mobile, when we took it away, we increased conversions. So if we'd only looked at the average, we would have shot ourselves in both feet, right? Because we really, really hurt ourselves. So this is super important. And the thing actually on mobile here is probably not that a progress bar doesn't work. It's because it was responsive, so it got squished together. So instead of being a progress bar, it just said one, two, three. So that's a weird user experience. This is very, very important. You have to, you have to integrate your, your test data in your analytics account, and you have to segment, and you have to be able to know and get the full picture. OK. Andre was talking about qualitative research for. It's very, very important. I used to not spend much time on it. I found out that it's one of the best sources of information, one of the best ways of building hypotheses. So I used to do a lot of customer interviews. And then I started doing with sales and customer service. But actually, what I spend most time now is actually talking to sales and customer service. These guys have so much knowledge. They spend days and days and days just talking to people. They understand all their problems. And actually, nobody wants to talk to them in companies. So these guys are so happy when you actually listen to them, right? So 
I have basically five very simple questions that I ask, and there's just a slight variation between sales and support. So I would say one of the first questions I ask is actually what are the top three questions you get from potential customers? That means we're not answering on the website. We need to know this, okay? When I got those, actually sometimes I spend half an hour talking about this, and then some, you know, they actually start answering the other questions. But this is the process. So this is... The follow-up question would be, what do you answer when you get these questions? These guys spend so much time explaining and solving questions, uh, solving problems. So uh, uh, all the answers they give, I can write them down. I can use them on my landing pages for my hypotheses, okay? So number three, what is the biggest barrier keeping people from buying a product? We need to understand this. This is central, central stuff. And then, of course, are there any specific selling points that work particularly well? If so, which ones? I can take these directly and use them on my, uh, in, my, um, on my, um, in my treatments. Okay? And then I'll round off just asking them, is there anything uh, important that we've missed? Is there anything you wanna, more you want to talk about? And then usually there's a couple of really good points we get there. Customer service, slight difference. Same, the top three, what do you answer? Then I say, are there any particular aspects that people don't understand? What aspects of the product do people like least the most, right? So it may seem like a very basic exercise, but it's incredible how much information you get out of this. This is the why. This is how you get into the minds of your prospects. I mentioned before, you need to ask yourself whether the hypothesis that you can test on your website is real. A very, very good acid test is to do a little calculation like I showed you before and just see how long will it take to run the split test and does it make any sense for us, right? Okay, rounding off. Test hypothesis only, your test is only as good as your hypothesis. So the better the research, the better the insight. The better the insight, the better the hypothesis. The better the hypothesis, the better the test. And the better uh, the test, the better the learning. So this is a whole process you've got to remember. And so, final closing remark. Don't be the split test junkie, be the conversion plumber. That's how you win. Thank you.